for those of you in the uh, in the webinar, you probably aren't attending in person. We aren't there either, but have been watching the sessions virtually and thought it would be fun to just sort of recap day one's discussion uh, and share the Avenue perspective. We had a pretty jam-packed first day. Mike Del Pret kicked off the morning with a session entitled 2022 WTF. I think that title more or less speaks for itself. We can all guess what that was about and we'll go into more detail uh, Glenn Kellman, the CEO of Redfin, talked about market conditions. Frederick Eklund talked about the role of social media. And the new COO of Realogy, which is now named Anywhere, uh, talked about all the different uh, sort of evolutions uh, in the industry from their perspective around the transaction. So uh, a lot to unpack here. Maybe just to kick it off, a question for, for you, Alan. Uh, the macro environment right now is very strange. There's a lot of uncertainty around the housing market. We see headlines around contracts being canceled, sales going down year over year. If you look at our data as a company, we're having record months. Our agents are doing lots of transactions. Prices are staying high. Rates are going up. Rates are going down. How do you make sense of this macro environment? What do you think is going on and how should people uh, think about it? Well, you know, one of the interesting things is when I look back over the last eight recessions that we had, there were only two recessions that actually affected the price of real estate. So just the fact that we're going into a, re a recession is no reason at all to believe that it's going to start to erode the prices of real estate. Prior to COVID, we thought the real estate market was going to be decimated because we couldn't even go show houses. And instead, prices went crazy and the whole market went crazy. So... I don't think we should throw away the baby with the bathwater right here. And I think we need to see what happens. The market has taken a pause right now, but literally everybody I know is either in Europe, going to Europe or coming back from Europe. So I wonder who's here, where are the agents? Where are the clients? So I think in September, when everybody gets back and we get to the end of September, I think we're gonna find a roar again in the marketplace. And I don't think that we're gonna find prices coming down. Thanks, Alan. Justin, you experienced a recession in San Francisco back in, in 2008. Uh, talk about your experience in that market and any similarities or differences uh, you see today. Well, I think, you know, obviously the markets we're in are super constrained in the first place, limited supply uh, and a lot of money circulating. And, you know, if you looked at like the Bay Area, then things, you know, prior to that were going, you know, getting 10, 15 plus offers. Uh, maybe they went down to two or three offers. Uh, so, you know, I, while there will be a, a little bit of a softening, it certainly won't be a softening in comparison to what you'd see in, in a lot of other markets, like what's going on in Boise, Idaho, for example. Uh, so still a relatively frothy market. And that really is because there's so much, you know, so many job opportunities in the Bay Area, New York City, and LA. Uh, so, you know, I really don't think that the markets are going to crash. There's, of course, a little bit of a correction. But again, this is a great opportunity for buyers who have been simply priced out because everything, including kind of the quote unquote, uh, less desirable properties were going well over asking. I think a lot of those now will, maybe they'll get one offer, two offers, but it'll allow for a lot of buyers to come in that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't have the opportunity. Yeah, I think that last point's a really good point. And even if you look at Avenue 8, our month of July, 66% of all our closed transactions were buyer representation. That's the highest it's ever been. And if you look back in January, that number was closer to 40%. So what's the takeaway there? Buyers see a lot of opportunity. Um, and despite whatever is happening with rates, clearly there's a lot of pent-up demand. And if prices are cooling or if the rate of price appreciation is cooling, uh, they now have a way in that they may not have had a little bit before. Let, let's shift gears a little bit to, to what Mike Del Pret was talking about in the beginning of his session, where he showed a chart that had a few different companies on it. You had Zillow, you had EXP, you had Douglas Elliman, you had Compass, you had you know Open Doors of the World, all very very different businesses. And we all you know know the phrase that cash is king. Uh, I think the theme of the last few years has been grow as fast as you can. And now the theme is more grow uh, uh, responsibly and, and with an eye towards uh, profitability. Uh, and if we, if we think about the future of brokerage and how brokerage is evolving to become more efficient in investing resources in better, smarter areas than before, uh, that was really the heart of the discussion. So maybe a question for Nick. Um, talk about your view on 
you know, the sort of current state and on, on, on the traditional brokerage model and how, whether it's companies like Avenue 8 or others can kind of play smarter uh, when building a brokerage in the future? Yeah, I think it, I mean, we, we... where we have an opportunity to, am I, am I frozen or you can you hear me? I, I, you're, a little bit, you're a little bit in and out. If you keep freezing, I'll toss it over to Alan until you're in a better zone, but, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I'll, go, I'll go off camera. Maybe that'll help. So, you know, we're already demonstrating it at, at Avenue 8. We're, we're, we, we, the landscape is we've already looked over the hill and seen what was coming. And the bottom line is we're, we've already been built for the future. Uh, I, I, you know, what you guys, uh, Justin, Michael, what you saw ahead of the curve, and then when you invited us to play with you, to really understand how do we build a smarter brokerage? And, and I remember saying to you when we first met that we can't build it the way it's already been built. It's got to be built differently. It's got to be built much more leanly. And if we're going to build technologies, they need to be the key. And I think we're discovering that. We're going through our own uh, growing pains. But I think we're so nimble and so ability to refine what we're doing. I think we're going to be very uh, much the competitive advantage to these other companies that are, it plays into the equation as well. We don't have any of that. So I think everybody's going to have to look towards that as they lean up and, and they become far more efficient. Yep. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. So, so that was a helpful sort of recap of, of the way the day started, uh, just sort of changing evolutions in the brokerage model and just why does this economic environment exist in the first place. Another big topic was around um, the changing nature of who's buying homes right now. You heard um, from Glenn Kelman, the CEO of Redfin, talk about how with the rise of institutional buyers buying a lot of properties, particularly single family residences, that in many ways, the real estate market is becoming more like the stock market. You are gonna to start to see a lot more volatility uh, in, in, in pricing swings, uh, uh, just by virtue of, of the consolidation of ownership. And, and, and certainly the iBuyer model, which has been uh, you know, growing and growing quickly over the last five or six years, um, has now reached an interesting inflection point. We saw, news this past week with Open Door that Open Door and the FTC reached a $62 million settlement uh, for uh, potentially misleading customers around the, the benefits of, of iBuying. It was uh, shown through data that Open Door tends to buy homes below their market value and that their fee structure ends up actually being much higher than a traditional five or 6%. Uh, that, that a seller would pay if working with a realtor. I think the takeaway from all of that is that the role of the agent is actually more important than ever before. Uh, and, and that despite innovation of different business models that maybe technology can unlock, ultimately the best outcomes happen when a great agent is able to support their, their client in the best way possible. So Alan, I mean, having seen a lot of different market cycles, having seen a lot of different models uh, kind of emerge, uh, how, how do you think an agent today um, needs to function differently than maybe an agent in the past? And, 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 and how do you kind of, um, uh, you know, advise agents when they are in markets or confronting these eye buyers or, or sellers that are looking at alternative paths of selling? How would you sort of guide them uh, on, on, on how to make decisions? Well, their job is increased in complexity. They have to not only follow the social media, but they also have to follow print. They have to go back to the basics. They have to be doing their door knocking. They have to be doing their farming and they have to be doing the social media. They've got to touch all bases to be current nowadays. And that's how they're going to get their best influx. I wouldn't depend on any one of those aspects. I would hit all of those so that I knew that I was covering every base. 100%. It may be a question, a question for, for you, Justin. Obviously, you know, in markets like San Francisco or LA, we, we don't see a lot of the 
open door type models, just kind of given the price point um, of homes. Um, but as far as the markets that, you know, companies like open door are in, uh, what is your view on sort of the short or long-term uh, viability of those types of models? In the models like an open door. Like a, yeah, like an open door, an offer pad or any of this sort of idea. I, I mean, I think what happens, you know, the markets that they're in tend to be more cookie cutter. So what happens when the market turns, the cookie cutter stuff sits. Uh, and so they're going to end up, I predict, sitting on a lot of inventory. And that's when the struggle is going to come out. You know, Open Door and these other iBuyer models haven't really experienced a major downturn since they started. Uh, and I think that's going to be an issue. And, you know, these are markets like Las Vegas, Phoenix, uh, and, you know, the kind of the more toll brother type communities, you know, where an agent isn't necessarily as vital. And, you know, those are the last proper, those are the properties that end up sitting there. Um, so that that that's going to be interesting to see because again they've only experienced you know up markets really. Yeah, I saw some data um, recently about some inventory that iBuyers had purchased in Phoenix and just days on market uh, taking up and then uh, sale price versus purchase price actually being you know five percent below uh, selling five percent below the purchase price. So I think you know even those large institutional buyers are confronting the, the realities of how to time and price uh, a market, even if the inventory is relatively similar, because there is this, you know, unknown variable of how the interest rate environment is going to yeah. um, impact the rate, the rate of, of offloading yeah. that inventory onto the buyer. Well, the only thing I'll add to that is, you know, the markets where homes are a million dollars and below, those are the people, those are the buyers that tend to be more affected by the interest rate hikes. You know, if you're talking with $3 million property, two and a half million dollar place in San Francisco, they're less affected by that. But this is going to affect a lot of buyers in the lower price point. And, you know, I'm already kind of seeing that a little bit. And like, if you look at Petaluma, for example, you know, there's more properties sitting on the market. The houses typically sell for around eight or nine, 900. They were selling for a million million one you know a year ago they're sitting there with with price cuts now um you know just goes to show so uh less we're less affected for sure in you know places like the bay area uh you know beverly hills Los santa monica san francisco new york but um you know these other markets where, where the price point is less is definitely gonna they're gonna feel something 100 percent Okay, so that was a good recap of, of basically the second half of Mike Dilpret's conversation and, and much of what Glenn Kelman, the Redfin CEO, was talking about. His general takeaway is that we're seeing uh, corrections happen sharper and at a steeper curve. So uh, to his uh, you know point, does the real estate market start to feel more like the stock market as institutional buyers uh, take up more market share uh, to be seen, but certainly, uh, certainly possible. Um, Nick, Frederick Eklund uh, was the third session this morning, and, and it was mostly talking about a, a new platform that he had launched, which is sort of a WhatsApp type uh, application for, for agents. But one thing he said was that if you want to be successful, if you want to learn uh, as an agent, if you want to grow your business, the best thing that you can do is to join a team. And I know that this is something that's very uh, meaningful to you. You've given talks about team dynamics. Uh, what do you think Frederick meant by that? And, 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 and maybe just share any thoughts you have on, um, you know, why joining a team now is maybe better than ever before. Yeah, I think as there's a constraint of uh, deals, I think the team leaders look to new sources of lead generation. And so they're looking to young people that are connected that can't close deals on their own. And so they bring them on their team and they grow into different geographies like Frederick's in LA, he's in New York. I think he's expanding uh, to Miami as well. So he's just looking to farm young talent that's connected and bring them into the fold. Now, why that makes sense for young talent is it's true. Odds are they can't close the deal persona and in If you're a young agent, I think you have a glorious opportunity to really evaluate 
what your micro market is, what your sphere of influence it is. And you don't necessarily need to join a team if you're willing to do the work now and do the role playing and do the things that you need to do so that you can become proficient and then thereafter confident in your abilities. Then you can start to invite people to engage with you. You'll feel more confident to ask those people for their business. And you'll also be more curious to engage people in conversation to see what their true needs are. Because at the end of the day, you, you buy a house or you sell a house, not as much based on what the market climate is. And if we can get our agents to understand that you're looking for those who have the need, those are the clients, those are the deals that you're going to make. And you can do this on your own. You can do this with the assistance of, of us as, as, your, as your team behind you to support you. You don't necessarily have to buy into the team dynamic, but to, to Frederick's point, that's his whole pitch, right? And that's his, that's his hook. And he's playing on potentially those, the fear of those that don't think they can do it themselves. But I'm going to say, all right. we're all going to say you can do it yourself. Well, well, and just to add to what Nick just said, I mean, if you look at any, any city or region, I mean, there are top agents who have big teams and then there are top individual agents who in many cases beat out all of those teams with the exception of a few. So you know, there's really no one style. Uh, it just come, does come down to, you know, the client having confidence that you can represent them in buying or selling. Definitely, definitely. Um, I want to circle back to something that was mentioned earlier um, about, you know, what the market might look like in September uh, and beyond. And, you know, um, Mike Del Pret's session 2022 WTF, maybe WTF means wait till the fall. Uh, maybe things will change. Alan, do you have a perspective on how much of the current market environment is really just, just an, an emotional uh, over rotation? Um, of, of, of people's fears of what's going to happen versus, you know, the fundamentals and kind of do you see um, uh, an opportunity for, for the market to pick back up uh, once we're out of the summer and, and, and now that there's a little bit more certainty uh, from the Fed around what to do in, uh, with, with rates? I think it's going to be a huge opportunity for buyers and I think they're going to realize that. And that's why I think they're going to come back to the market in earnest in September and things are going to pick up dramatically. We're gonna have an increase in inventory in September. And I think the buyers are gonna be encouraged by the interest rates not going up dramatically and the rise in inventory. Because that rise in inventory will give them the ability to negotiate on the property and have actual contingencies with the property and actually maybe get concessions from the seller. So I think because the buyers got none of that in the last couple of years, that then when they realize that they're going to be able to get that and there's an increase in inventory, I think we're going to see a lot of activity in the market based on those factors. I, I would I would totally agree with that. And so my takeaway is, you know, if you're if you're an agent right now and you're not super busy, you're about to be super busy in about a month's time. So the question for Nick and Alan and Justin, whoever wants to answer, what can you be doing right now to prepare for that? you know, sort of impending wave of busyness that could be 30, 45 days away. Well, I'll just jump in and say, whatever you do now is going to show effect in three plus months. Uh, so people may be vacation vacationing now, but put in the work now because all these buyers who've been saying, when are things going to cool off? You know, there's no way to predict nobody has a crystal ball, but the reality is there's probably less than a two-year window now where, where they will get a relative deal on property. Um, and so I would present it as a big opportunity, certainly to, to every buyer you have and work on, uh, you know, how are you going to present that to buyers, your sphere of influence? But again, whatever you do now is going to really show effect in, in three plus months. I would also add, I, I absolutely agree with that. What you, the seeds you plant today germinate in that 60 to 90 day period of time. And I would also get very proficient with today's statistics. Understand how long things are on the market. Use statistics to articulate and demonstrate your expertise that you understand this specific market, not the market that it was, not the hyperbole, not the, the doom and gloom, the market as it stands fundamentally, statistically, if you have a sphere of influence, if you have specific people that, that your geography that you want to work on and focus on, know it, digest it, own it, and start to promote it from that perspective and start looking for the deal. Start 
looking at the properties that are on the market for 45 days right now. Watch them. If they're on the market in 60 days, and you're going to see a price reduction, that could very well be a deal. You then start to promote your sphere of influence. Hey, anybody looking at Santa Monica right now? Because I'm seeing something on the market for 60 days. I think there's a deal to be had here. That kind of enthusiasm, that's how you start to stimulate activity for yourself. That's great. That, that, that's that's oh. very good advice. I think, yeah, no, nothing is better than, you know, being proficient on the market using data that can support all of the other sort of, you know, important soft skills that, that, that good agents have um, of, of communication and, and negotiation. Well, I, I think just to add, you know, I, like, you know, most buyers are going to say, when is I'm waiting for the opportunity, the perfect time to buy? When is it going to bottom out? And obviously there's no way to know that, but if you do have all the statistics uh, on the market and what's out there in the inventory, you'll be able to say, listen, uh, now is the time like these are the places that are sitting there. They never would have been sitting there six months ago. Like I, I can't tell you when the exact bottom will be, but now is as good of a time as ever. All right. Well, we covered a lot. Uh, Alan, Nick, Justin, uh, and, uh, any any final comments or or takeaways from today's Inman sessions? Um, are there no rocket scientists up there? Uh, they're all articulating <laughs> what we already know. So now more than ever, stay close to us, uh, pick our brains. We've, we've been through four of these downturns. We know how to work through it and we're going to do it together. And I'm just excited about what, you know, what the WTF is wait until fall. And I think it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> wait until fall. <laughs> I like that. Yep. All right. Well, uh, for everyone in the room, uh, thank you so much for tuning in to our semi real-time Inman day one recap. Uh, it's uh, not as good as the Super, Super Bowl halftime show, um, <laughs> but, but it's also better than QVC. Uh, big thanks to Alan, thanks to Nick, thanks to Justin uh, and to the team for setting this up. Uh, have a great one and we'll share any more juicy updates as they happen. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody, bye-bye.